Hi, everybody out there. Hi, Walborg. Hi, Markus. Hi, Jörg. It's a pleasure to see you and um, also to see all the faces I can't see, actually. Um, before introducing um, our guests to this next session, I would like to uh, have a brief intro to that. Um, the session title reads, Decarbonization Beyond Electricity, Can We Scale Up Quick Enough? Or are we too little too late? And in the last session, actually, listening to uh, my colleague, uh, Dirk Sweeter, and his guests, um, speed was a phrase that was mentioned over and over and over again. So uh, speed. Speed is driven by our 2030 targets. Um, the 2030 targets, 65% for Germany, 55% CO2 reduction for Europe, is something that is really difficult to, to get. And what do I do when I try to summarize that? I'm actually taking this piece of chocolate here. Um, it's a piece of chocolate, and most of you know that, four by four. It kind of symbolizes our energy system in a way. We've got four columns for the four sectors. Heat, transport, industry, and electricity. And we've got four segments within for each 25%. So where are we today? Today we are in the electricity sector. 50%, I looked it up at uh, Spiegel Online this morning, 46% is renewable generation. The rest is fossil. So molecules play a tremendous role in our energy world. And decarbonizing them is, is a challenge that requires speed. Of course, to be frank, in a couple of these sectors, mobility, for example, we are basically uh, decarbonizing by reducing the amount of chocolate a bit by using more efficient technologies. Same goes for heating. But that does not apply everywhere. So we'll need a lot of renewables, and that's kind of limited to build out. Um, we need a lot of efficiency, so shrinking the chocolate bar, but also that won't do it. So we need to look at molecules. And um, looking at these molecules, we are instantly going to hydrogen, actually. Um, we are later on deviating a bit to look at other innovations as well. But uh, hydrogen in all uh, shapes and colors, uh, shapes is a bit difficult, but colors in the transition phase, and then probably converting to green. Um, to discuss that and how we can speed that up, we have three great, great guests. Um, three guests I really love to discuss individually and uh, also in this group. Um, they cover the whole value chain of hydrogen. Um, we are starting, therefore, with Markus Exenberger, who is um, CEO of the H2 Global Advisory. It's a foundation, or it's uh, driving the build-up of a foundation uh, that he'll re um, explain later on. He has over 20 years as manager uh, within GIZ, that's a German uh, Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit, so for big international projects. Then we have, moving from the green um, molecule over to the transportation of that molecule, we have Jörg Bergmann, who is um, kind of a colleague, actually, coming from the family, but now running the biggest uh, and, and kind of leading TSO in, in uh, Europe. Um, so he's over 10 years with, with, with E.ON, actually, in the past, but now uh, leading Open Grid Europe. And then, last but not least, we have Walborg Lundegaard, who is uh, over 20 years in the oil and gas industry and actually now running a kind of startup. It's a bit unfair to call you startup, I think, because you raised about two, mil two billion market capitalization, as far as I know, um, providing decarbonization solutions. So um, welcome. I'm very, very glad to have you here. And I would uh, pass the word uh, to Marcus first um, and ask you, and we, we are passing the baton then uh, to each of you, to give a brief introduction about your organization and then also to spice it up in the direction of what we are trying to achieve here. Uh, reflecting a bit on can we speed up to really uh, kind of jointly eat the chocolate bar? Or, um, and what does it take to meet the 2030 targets? So, um, Marcus. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, sorry for uh, I, I gave you the promise that I will be in in in, in Essen uh, at your venue. I couldn't manage to do so because of a corona situation in my family. But now it is uh, all clear. The PCR test was negative, but uh, it it describes a little bit that we are living in a. In a, in a very interesting time. Um, I'm um, a founder and, um, and uh, one of the people who invented the idea or the concept of H2 Global uh, as a market ramp up mechanism uh, with state guaranteed compensation for price difference uh, between, let's say, the high costs for uh, green uh, uh, PTX products and uh, green hydrogen in comparison to the fossil uh, um, uh, products. This is uh, what we developed last year, uh, what we developed uh, jointly with a whole group of people within GRZ and within other organizations. And we developed this concept and this idea for, for, the, for the German government, uh, especially here in that case for the BMW i. The project or the concept H2 Global is now running. Uh, we established the foundation for that. Uh, it is established now by uh, 24 uh, European companies, uh, all the big ones from, from, from Germany and uh, now uh, more and more European uh, industrial companies and uh, companies from the industrial, se from the financial sector uh, join the foundation. So we are up and running. And uh, what is our aim now to start with the whole process of uh, uh, bringing it into practice with the whole process of auctioning uh, the, the uh, first products and the first uh, derivatives uh, in the end of this year. Later on, uh, I think I, I might have the challenge or the, 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 the chance to give a little bit more insights about what does it mean H2 Global. Thank you. So we got a few ideas on where we get uh, some of the H2, the green H2 in the, on the long run or not so long run actually from. And then we need to, of course, transport that. So uh, Jörg Bergmann, um, may I invite you to, to also introduce, I, I mean, most people know OGE, but... Um. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Carsten. I will keep it short. Uh, we are a large uh, transmission operator and uh, our network comprises uh, 12,000 kilometers. That's comparable with the German highway uh, system. We are headquartered in Essen with almost uh, 1,500 employees. Um, and uh, um, uh, before I start with our ambition uh, in the direction of hydrogen, let me start with the key belief uh, of our company. We are committed uh, to the goal of climate neutrality uh, and that was a starting point for our strategy update more than four, year, four years ago when we discussed the role of gas and uh, uh, the role of our infrastructure. And uh, as you said in the introduction, 80% of our energy system consists uh, uh, of molecules and uh, there will be an adjustment uh, in the relation over the time, uh, but uh, also in uh, 2050, we will need uh, some molecules. And the question is, how can we de decarbonize uh, the molecules? And uh, uh, the solution is clear. You mentioned it several times. Uh, uh, hydrogen is one of uh, the solution. And, uh, uh, we looked at it and said this is a cost-efficient uh, way to uh, reach the climate uh, goals. And in addition, it supports security of supply uh, and the resilience of our energy system. You know, uh, molecules can be stored over a long time, over a season, and uh, that's a challenge uh, with uh, electrons. and. Uh, uh, another um, uh, advantage is affordability. Uh, we have to discuss uh, the sectors where, they can be, uh, where hydrogen can be applied. Uh, from the discussion in the National Hydrogen Council, it's uh, clear uh, uh, and it's all uh, so laid down in the um, hydrogen strategy of our government that uh, the first sector uh, to um, apply hydrogen should be the industry. But there are also uh, um, appliances in heavy duty transport, uh, 
uh, on the road, on the railway, uh, and on the ship. And uh, uh, the most challenging question is um, uh, uh, how to deal uh, with the heating sector. And uh, what are we doing uh, at uh, OGE? Uh, we have a lot of uh, projects, and I will come later to that. Uh, but uh, we are now working on making our network hydrogen ready. Thank you. That brings us uh, to another source of hydrogen, uh, or not just hydrogen, actually. Carbon capture can be used for many things, actually. Um, Walburg, glad to have you here. So can you tell us a bit about ARCA uh, CCS? Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Kirsten. Yeah, you introduced Ocker Carbon Capture as a startup company, and uh, yes, it is right. We were established a year ago. However, we're part of the big Ocker group with 180 years of industrial development. And uh, we also have uh, a number of sister companies in the Ocker group uh, with product execution capability, digitalization skills, and so on. So we're not alone. Um, our technology uh, is proven and has been developed over almost 20 years. Uh, we have a double-digit number of patents related to our carbon capture technology. But uh, right after uh, we were established as a pure play company to focus on this market and customers uh, purely, uh, we were awarded a large carbon capture contract um, from Heidelberg Cement. Uh, this is the first carbon capture uh, contract of a cement facility in the world. And it's part of the Norwegian uh, full value CCS uh, uh, project Longship. Uh, the plant and the whole value chain will be in operation in 2024. When we established the company, uh, we were approached uh, by customers from all over the world who wanted us uh, to look at how we could help them reducing their CO2 uh, emissions. But we had to prioritize. So uh, based on customer interest, but also regulatory regime and maturity in the various countries, we prioritized Northern Europe. And we have four segments that we prioritize. It's cement, where CO2 emissions are hard to evade. 60% comes from the limestone process itself. Uh, we prioritize uh, waste to energy and bioenergy. And bioenergy plants are by nature carbon neutral. So when we remove the CO2 from these plants, we actually go carbon negative or removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere. Then we prioritize gas to power plants with uh, carbon capture and storage. And finally, blue hydrogen which I'm sure we will talk more about. <laughs> yes, thank you. So uh, we learned about the, the first options. We learned about hydrogen readiness of the um, infrastructure. We learned about uh, not only um, uh, Heidelberg cement and direct carbon capture, and but also blue hydrogen. Um, but I, I would like to come back to, to this thing here. Um, and the ability um, or the question, what does it take um, to meet the 2030 objectives or goals? Or are we meeting them at all? Um, maybe um, it's also, I mean, it's a bit more difficult to have an online discussion, but if you want to jump in and comment, please, please feel free. That's um, a bit more interesting than just me interviewing. So I, I would encourage you. But maybe, Marcus, we start with you again, and then um, we take it from there. Austin, if, if, if you allow me, I was, I was very brief now in my introduction and uh, in the introduction of H2 Global. If you, if you agree or if you allow me, I would give some, some, some more few words about how does it work and uh, what does it mean H2 Global. And I think that that would, would uh, lead as well to my answer now to your question. The aim of H2 Global concept is to initiate and support a private uh, sector ramp up of the market of green hydrogen and PTX products. That's, that's the core question uh, we, we, we started uh, to give an answer to. The core problem of the market development is the ex existing price difference between the product costs for green hydrogen and derivates and, for example, ammonia, icarosine, a meth methanol product. And currently, uh, the private neutral variants cannot be yet uh, be produced economically. That's, that's, that it was something we all facing. Uh, government support is therefore really needed, and uh, it is a quick demand uh, uh, and uh, uh, to 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 
uh, there, there is a quick demand and uh, as well the need of, of very large projects. The core element of the H2 Global uh, idea is, is based on a sta state guaranteed uh, compensation uh, of the current and medium term price difference between the product costs and the purchase prices achievable on the market for H2 and PTX products. Uh, um, Accompanied by regulatory measures to further stimulate demand uh, for carbon-free energy sources, this will be enable later on uh, the private sector to build and expand uh, the capacities uh, required uh, for a sustainable market establishment. We established for, for that particular purpose an, an intermediary, we call them HINCO. And the HINCO is acting now between the supply and the demand side. Uh, on the purchase side, the intermediary invites tenders for up to, an, up to for 10 years purchase agreements uh, for defined quantities of green products like hydrogen or PTX products. The contracts are awarded and this is very important and that was very important for the German government on a competitive basis. The contract is awarded to the most favorable bid in each case combined with proof strict of compliance and uh, specified uh, sustainability criteria. On the sales side, and this is, let's say, the other side of the medal, uh, the intermediary also tenders contracts or on a corresponding scale. This have a significantly shorter term and price committed period. So far, let's say between several months and a few years, the difference between the, the, the purchase agreement and the sales uh, agreement will be made up by the intermediary, uh, so-called HINCO, until available funds are used. Available funds means Already we have 900 million euros provided by the German government. This is the money available for, for H2 Global for the first round. Up to appropriate uh, regulation eliminates the difference. So that means for a time period until we have really an, an, an sufficient uh, regulation made by the European Commission, made by the German government, this price difference is significantly there and can be covered even uh, through the H2 Global mechanism. We are using a foundation to establish, uh, or a foundation is established to, 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 to put all these things into practice. We have 24 companies involved now, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in, 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 in these, uh, in these foundations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, also yeah. kind of move the question on to, to, to Jörg's and maybe to, to both of you. So I could say I need an amount X of green hydrogen by tomorrow in Duisburg. Yes, uh, it's not an unusual situation because one uh, big steel customer uh, located there came to us uh, and said, yes, can you transport it uh, to me? Yeah? And uh, uh, that leads us uh, to one concrete uh, project um, uh, of our company together with some project uh, partners and this is uh, Get H2 Nucleus. Uh, the main idea is uh, in the first step to have an electrolyzer in, the, in Lower Saxony, then transport uh, the gas uh, via pipelines, which were repurposed uh, CH4 pipelines uh, uh, in the rural area. In the first step in the northern rural area to, uh, uh, to uh, chemical uh, companies and uh, then uh, in a second uh, step in the project, uh, it is planned uh, also uh, to, um, to have a pipeline uh, for hydrogen uh, to Duisburg. Huh? And this is uh, coming uh, the demand from the market. And uh, we see also uh, producers are there to build electrolyzers. And uh, as Marco said, we are in a very early phase. And if you want to... Uh, uh, meets the uh, uh, goals in 2030, we have to uh, speed up huh? and uh, we need uh, an industrial scaling. If we look uh, at the electrolyzers today, they are in a magnitude of 20 or 30 uh, megawatt. The next step is 100 uh, uh, megawatt, but we must uh, uh, go make the step from tailor-made uh, to more industrial uh, um, 
and scaled um, uh, electrolyzers. That's the first step. Uh, on the second step, uh, we uh, the question is how to connect uh, uh, the customers and the producers and uh, the uh, uh, um, most cheapest solution is uh, for large hydrogen volumes to transport it uh, via pipeline. And uh, in Germany, we have the situation due to the phase out of the low calorific gas, we, uh, in the next years, uh, we have some free capacities in pipelines so that they can be uh, repurposed uh, then uh, for hydrogen. Huh? Um, to give it a more European perspective, uh, we work together also with uh, um, 22 other uh, European TSOs and uh, develop the concept of a hydrogen backbone. And uh, we ask uh, ourselves the question, where does uh, the hydrogen in future comes from? Uh, one uh, potential resource uh, is um, uh, uh, wind uh, and then electrolyzers in the North Sea and uh, to transport it from the north or uh, photovoltaic in the uh, southwest of Europe and uh, electrolyzers and transport it uh, then also uh, to uh, Western Europe. And uh, what we developed is a system uh, for the year 2030 with uh, roughly 11,500 uh, kilometers and uh, in 2040, it is expected to go to almost uh, 40,000 kilometers. And uh, the decisive question is, what will be the uh, cost of transportation? And if I look at the specific cost, they will be in a magnitude of between 10 and 20 uh, cent per kilogram hydrogen per thousand kilometers. And you have to compare that with the target price in production of hydrogen, and it's the target price for the year uh, 2030 and afterwards of 1.5 uh, to 2 uh, euros, which is very much below uh, our uh, today's uh, price signals. And uh, what we can offer for this transport uh, is uh, to... Um, we propose 70% uh, uh, existing pipelines. It's all said we have only 30% new build of pipelines. And uh, this means a cost advantage, uh, but also a time savings because we have uh, all uh, this right of way and approvals in place. Okay, thank you. So um, we have um, an offer. Um, at least an initial one. We have uh, some infrastructure emerging. Um, I'm, I'm yielding with one eye to the screen with um, uh, questions from the audience, actually. And Walborg, I think there's an interesting one. Um, and maybe I add my own to it. Um, so if we have green and the infrastructure, do we need blue then? And then the question from the audience reads, has blue hydrogen a right to be used in the net zero future? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, what, first, I would like to say I believe we need both blue and green, and I mean, think we need it for the future. But uh, we can, we have to start now. Uh, we heard from the previous session that speed was of the essence, and then we really cannot wait. We have to take into uh, consideration all opportunities to reduce CO2 emissions. And uh, when EU presented the hydrogen strategy last summer, uh, you know, there was also um, an opportunity to retrofit existing hydrogen production uh, with uh, CCS. And um, EU estimated that if you could retrofit 50% of that, uh, it will um, um, be an investment of around 11 billion euro. But we have to get started. Uh, we have to use a blue hydrogen or retrofit of existing hydrogen facilities uh, to build the infrastructure. The infrastructure is colorblind and we need blue hydrogen to pave the way for green hydrogen. And in the future, we need both. So for me, it's speed of the essence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You already kind of hinted in the direction of what do we really need? What, what is it? Is it, uh, and I'm getting back to my, my chocolate bar, um, <laughs> are we really kind of consuming all of it? Or if we don't need to do that by 55%, uh, we of course, um, half of it is enough. But um, so is it really that, that the measures we have on the table at the moment are sufficient? 
Are you asking a follow-up question to me? No, there was a question no, in in the, into the round well, in general. Okay, but uh, let me just uh, give a comment. You know, from, yes. uh, you know, we have the technology available. Our our carbon capture technology has been tested over a year on a hydrogen production unit in Sweden. We know it, that it works. Uh, we've teamed up uh, with the Holder Topsa, uh, maybe the the world's leading hydrogen um, for, uh, process provider, and we're working on you know really integrating and make that. Uh, process efficiently. We're working uh, with Research Institute uh, to uh, make uh, mega scale uh, new hyd hydrogen plants more efficient. So we have the technology, but we're also on a journey on developing the technology. Mm -hmm. Please, by my head, yes. uh, uh, Carsten, uh, I think we have uh, very ambitious targets, but uh, the instruments are still uh, missing. No? And uh, the technology uh, is in place uh, and is uh, well known. Uh, but what is missing, uh, the legal framework, the regulatory framework, instruments uh, to bridge the economic uh, gap. Uh, this H2 Global is one instrument, uh, but uh, we have to develop other, looking more at uh, European uh, production and uh, production from European neighboring uh, countries. And we have to uh, ask the question how to how to finance this. And uh, uh, this uh, discussion uh, is ongoing, but it's ongoing more in Brussels than in Berlin. Huh? And uh, uh, I think uh, our new government has a task uh, to uh, bring uh, in the German view with a clear uh, with a clear signal. Yeah. Um, thank you. And it really perfectly matches another question I see on the screen here, which comes from the audience, which is actually what changes need to be made first to become carbon neutral as fast as possible. And I think you, you answered to that. Um, I think um, if, perhaps to Marcus, um, can we scale H2 Global by just putting more money in or is there a limit? And then the second part of the question, which role does innovation play? You said, uh, Jörg just said, we have everything on the table. So um, I would draw a quite broad innovation idea or um, phrase, which includes other things like ammonia or biomethane or uh, also maybe CO2 pipes. Um, I'm again, going back to the, to the chocolate bar and the amount of chocolate we have to digest. So. First of all, uh, what, what, what Jörg already mentioned, so uh, H2 Global is one, one uh, mechanism, is one instrument, but you can use it as well for the European or for the German market ramp up. It is just now made or used for the international market ramp up because uh, the money provided uh, to H2 Global, these first 900 million euros are from, from this uh, COVID recovery fund, from this uh, uh, fund for the international market ramp up. But you can use it as well in, 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 in a part of Germany I mean, you can use it in Europe, uh, whatever. There are other instruments uh, um, supported by the German government. Let's say, for example, this IPSE, these important projects for common European interest. We have this Förderrichtlinie in Germany. There are already some, some uh, let's say, market stimulation mechanisms uh, on the market. But nevertheless, uh, um, some of them, they need more time. H2 Global is made for, for you know, to, to speed up a little bit more and, uh, you know, provided uh, our projects provided uh, through H2 Global are able to deliver, hopefully, if the uh, industrial sector is, 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 is ready to do so, to deliver the first products in the end of 24 and the beginning of 25. So it needs, and uh, I'm absolutely uh, on the same page like, like Jörg, uh, it, it, it needs a, a, a a diversified uh, um, um, instrument or diversified instrument tools now uh, to stimulate a, a, a wider market ramp up, but uh, they are there. Coming back to your question, uh, Carsten, um, there is, in, in general, there is first of all no limit. Uh, we started with the with H2 global mechanism. Now, now we have to deal with the first 900 million. We have to do that properly, not only 100%, I would say 110%. This is, uh, let's say, what, what we need to deliver and this is what we need to achieve uh, in the end of this year. We will see however it works and uh, then we are ready for, you know, to, to, to scale up and uh, to deliver 
deliver more services to whoever wants us uh, to do it. Uh, it is made for the German government, it is provided for the German government, but we are now since a couple of months even in, in negotiation with other uh, with other. Uh, with other countries, with other uh, you know donors, with other uh, institutions, and uh, like I said, it is just a mechanism. It is an instrument, and it can be used for the market ramp up. Whoever mm. wants to do so. Okay. Um, there is another question coming in. Uh, for which sectors do you see hydrogen as most impactful to become carbon neutral? Transport, road transport, shipping, air industry, electricity, or heating of buildings? Um, I, I know I'm uh, yielding to the screen again. Uh, I know that Jörg did spend a lot of time looking at these questions in the Hydrogen Council. Maybe you want to give it a first shot then? Yes, uh, I can do this. Uh, first of all, it's crystal clear uh, that we need hydrogen in the industry. We are looking at steel industry, we are looking at chemical industry. And uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, if um, there is an initial ramp up of the hydrogen uh, economy, then the question is, what are other sectors which uh, need hydrogen? And it's also uh, uh, no point of discussion that uh, hydrogen will be needed in heavy duty road transport and uh, non-electrified uh, railways. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, um, and also uh, for uh, ship transportation. And the question of the heating market um, uh, is, um, uh, uh, is a very hot discussed uh, uh, question because it depends uh, on your viewpoint. Huh? But uh, the reality doesn't depend on the viewpoint. The reality uh, is depending uh, on the existing structure of buildings uh, and uh, uh, small industrial and commercial customers which are connected to the DSO network. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, in the National Hydrogen Council, we decided to set up a so-called bottom-up uh, study where we looked at uh, 10 or 12 uh, um, um, cities uh, and small communes and uh, 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 gather there the, um, uh, the data uh, from uh, the buildings and uh, look at uh, different passes uh, and what will be the outcome. Uh, because uh, if you are looking at a new building, it's crystal clear heating pump is the answer. If you are looking at a old block of uh, uh, apartments, um, and uh, uh, from 50 years old, then the question is, uh, what might be there the best uh, solution? And uh, we don't uh, we uh, don't have to make the mistake to answer it only from the side of appliance. We have to look at the whole uh, value chain. Uh, what does it mean for the DSOs network, for the TSOs uh, network? Uh, to come uh, to the best solution. From my point of view, uh, there will be uh, different appliances uh, for hydrogen in uh, different uh, sectors and not uh, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would like to also come back again to the innovation part uh, about which other innovations we see or need might, maybe, um, and Walborg, maybe to you, the, first of all, the general innovation question, and then I see a, a quite specific question. Maybe you can very, very briefly answer that, uh, how your carbon capture technology actually works. Uh, that probably yields another or <laughs> justifies another lecture, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it's um, a biodegradable, uh, I mean, uh, absorption solvent that really captures the CO2 in the flue gas. Uh, and uh, this uh, solvent goes in a closed loop uh, and is recycled. And then the CO2 is captured when it's heated again. It's uh, compressed and uh, and liquefied and then it's liquefied for transportation on truck um, train uh, or ship that was uh, a very quick yes. uh, <laughs> introduction and, and do you see other things we are not seeing in the energy system at the moment so other means of infrastructure for example co2 pipes could be an idea 
uh, even so they are just for intermediate period or other things like ammonia or maybe, I mean, if we have carbon captured somewhere, um, we can use it uh, together with hydrogen was yesterday on the news in Germany to produce jet fuels, for example, need mm. to come from a source that's sustainable, of course. But um, so are you seeing that? In, in yeah, of as, course, as uh, of there it? are yeah. there are opportunities where you can uh, use uh, the CO2. Uh, we are capturing uh, CO2 now on the project. We will hope to start in the next couple of months uh, in the Netherlands. It's a waste to energy provider. In this case, uh, the CO2 will be used as a fertilizer for a greenhouse. Uh, other uh, prospects uh, look into um, um, providing, for instance, jet fuel. Uh, but uh, you really need to add energy because, you know, CO2 comes from the combustion process uh, normally. So you need to add energy to, uh, you know, uh, uh, take that process uh, in a reversed, uh, reversed <laughs> way. So, um, but if you really want to make a difference climate-wise, and I think this is the big uh, goal for all of us. We need to meet net zero in 2050. Uh, we need to meet the target set for 2030. Then you need permanent storage of CO2. And like I said, uh, removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere, like you can do uh, with bioenergy plants with carbon capture. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm seeing the clock running down, um, three minutes and a bit. Um, we have um, another question which refers more to regulation and regulatory requirements. I mean, in the light of the currently ongoing uh, Red 2 Delegated Act discussion, so what actually uh, green is, I would kind of put that question aside because it's difficult to answer at this point in time. So I would actually go to the, uh, to using the last three minutes to a question. Um, if we fast forward to 20, 23, not to go too far ahead. What do we need to see? And it would be a minute each for you to answer it. What do we need to see to know we are on the right track? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I can start if you want. Yeah. So I would say regulation, regulation, regulation. This is what we need, and this is what we need. We need a clear, a clear vision and a clear picture from the from the European Commission. We need it from the German government. And uh, what 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 I see on the market, there are a, a, a lot of good projects developed in a, in, a, in a very further stage. Uh, uh, instruments are there, or uh, let's say instruments are available differently. Uh, and uh, but what what we need is a clear guidance. It is a clear is, is clear regulation. This is what the financial sector needs. Uh, this is what the what the industrial sector really needs. And I think then 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 we can we can really start uh, or that the market ramp up can can take place. Uh, but but guidance and regulation is is, is key. Thank you. Who wants? Okay, uh, if I may yes. challenge that, sure. uh, I, I don't think we have time to wait uh, for all regulations to be in place. I'm, we need to take action now. And when we talk to a number of our customers who are large emitters, uh, they more and more uh, tell us uh, that it's uh, becoming a license to operate, to reduce their CO2 emissions. And we as an industry need to take responsibility. Uh, in aquacarbon capture, we are working with our um, partners uh, to reduce the cost of our offering. Uh, that's our responsibility. And we've also um, uh, come up with a new innovative uh, offering where we do carbon capture as a service, where the, where the uh, customer, the emitter pays uh, per CO2 uh, captured um, by us. So I think uh, it requires collaboration, it requires bold innovation by the industry, and it requires really bold commitments uh, uh, from the emitters. Thank you. Jörg. So now it's easy for me. Uh, <laughs> from my point of view, we need both. We need to start now uh, and we need uh, the right uh, legal and regulatory uh, framework for it. If you're looking at the projects we are talking about, they often have lead times of more than five years, sometimes seven years. Huh? That means uh, in 23, you must have uh, all uh, 
uh, all the framework uh, to come to a final investment uh, decision. Yeah? And uh, if we look uh, at the uh, uh, transportation of uh, C uh, CO2, uh, then we have to look what is the, fr uh, then the framework uh, to build uh, the CO2 uh, pipelines has to be adjusted. What we need uh, from my point of view, is uh, political political decisions uh, with speed and courage uh, uh, to try options out. Uh, because uh, if we wait and discuss where can be a challenge, we will never succeed. Thank you. That was perfectly on time. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. And um, the the bad thing about this online format is actually that we can't eat the chocolate together <laughs> and that we can't have a beer together now. But I hope um, we can can have that in future. Thank you. Really a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was day one of the Energy Innovation Days 2021. It was all about electrification, and we started the day uh, by saying sustainability means innovation. And that innovation drives progress, and this is the way we tackle the big challenges of our time, as we just heard. Uh, but it's also a challenge that drives growth for the companies involved. Uh, we heard a lot about decarbonization and the power of hydrogen. We heard about decentralized versus distributed networks. Uh, we heard about the threat of a blackout. We also heard about the potential of green investments and support systems for this net zero future we want to go into. The opportunities beyond electricity are wide open now. And two things we heard to make all of this happen over and over again today, and that was speed up and scale up. And in that fashion, I just want to end day one and invite you all uh, to join us tomorrow. But before I do that, I want to thank all our experts, all our panelists, all the keynote speakers today, and of course you as the audience for your participation, for your questions, for your insights and your input, and for your networking. I hope you did. Um, if not, join us again tomorrow. The entire day tomorrow will be about connectivity. Super exciting lineup of speakers again. and. I wish you a happy rest of your day, wherever you are, and see you on the other side. Thank you so much.